This is programming chapter five. This time we're going to look at arrays and strings. And you haven't seen much difference between Java, Objective C, and C up till now. And the syntax is pretty close. And you've noticed the differences when we're dealing with libraries. And it's no surprise that Java adopted the C syntax because it's made it easier for programmers to move from one language to another. And that's the reason why it's important to learn the basics and the concepts of one language really well, because it carries over to other languages. As we move on to more complicated things, there will be larger differences between these languages, especially in the area of how the standard libraries are put together. Once again, we will backtrack to solidify our knowledge. And before using variables, they must be declared. We can use either of two syntaxes. We can say the data type and the identifier, or we can say the data type identifier equals some initial value. And it's always safer to use the initial value declaration. The compiler will warn you if you try to use a variable without assigning it a value. And if you don't assign a value, the value is going to be unknown. When we use arrays uh, with control statements, our code becomes easier to manage. It's easier to initialize and to iterate. To declare basic arrays, we use the following syntaxes. We can say data type, identifier, and in square brackets, list the size. Don't go over this size or you'll be generating an error. And most likely it'll be a runtime error. We can use data type identifier and size n and initialize it. We initialize this with curly brackets. We can say element one, comma, element two, comma, dot, 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 all the way to element n. Another way to specify it is data type identifier square brackets without the size. And we have the curly bracket and again, n elements and curly bracket. And what it will automatically do is put the size n into the brackets. This is safer if you don't know the number of elements. And to access any array element, we just use identifier bracket and then the element number. So it could be element number zero, element number 11, and we could have something equal to this or this can equal something. We use it just like a variable. Now, if we look back to exercise 3.4, the min and max of a list, you can see that a lot of code is required if we want to find the minimum and the maximum of a list of 10 numbers. Arrays always start with index zero and end with this list size minus one. And this is a major source of bugs when using arrays. Accessing element list size will produce an array out of bounds error or a runtime error. So your first exercise is to modify the template and calculate the maximum sum and average of a list of 10 numbers. And recall that the average is the sum of the list divided by the list size. So let's look at the sample program. Here we are initializing our array of 10 numbers. Remember, it's going to automatically put 10 into this for the dimension. So what we'd first like to do is just print out this array. And then we initialize the minimum to the first element. It's always best to initialize to the first element rather than negative one or zero, because if our minimum is all above, say, 10, and you've initialized it to zero, that's automatically an error. So what we do next is we loop. And if the minimum is bigger than the array element, we just say the minimum is now that element. If it's not, then it'll just skip this. Notice that we only need nine compares and we only have one extra variable. 
So let's run this. So we look through the list and the minimum number is negative 14 and that's correct here. Let's set a breakpoint and step through this code because it's important that you understand it. And we'll watch the locals. And we'll just step over. And we can see that min is now set to 10. We're checking against the second element, which is 7. And 7 is lower. So now we're going to set min to 7. Now we're on the next element. We're looking at negative 1. Again, negative 1 is lower. So we're setting min to negative 1. And now we're at 23. 23 is not less than negative 1, so we skip over. And I think you get the idea here. Every time it gets a lower one, it sets it. And then we'll just finish running it. It shouldn't be difficult. You just need to set up a couple more variables. One for the maximum, one for the sum. The average will be calculated, so you don't need to set a variable for that. And we have the size of the array, so you don't need to count the number of elements. And what you're trying to produce is this output. So, as programmers, we're not always experts in the area that we're doing work. But we still need to be able to create code and test it. And after doing this work, we may gain some expertise in this area. So, let's look at the next program. Here, we have the standard list that will produce these numbers. So, I suggest you leave the standard list to start off. When you have generated the correct code, then you can uncomment this, comment that, uncomment this, and you'll be running your code on a random set of numbers. So let's look at this piece of code. This will generate a random number between 0 and 99, and then subtract 30. So it'll go from negative 30 to 69. And we want some negative numbers in there just to make sure our code work was, works with never, negative numbers. And I've given you the order for how to calculate the standard deviation. You need to calculate the sum. Then you calculate the average. Then you calculate the sum of squared deviations. And this is the differences from the mean. So that's this number. So you'll need to loop to do this calculation. So when you loop, you'll need to take each element, subtract it from the mean, and then square this result and add them all together. Once you have the sum of the squared deviations, we want to calculate the variance. This is just the average of the sum of the squared deviations. So the average is just dividing by this big N. And then finally, you just calculate the standard deviation by taking the square root of the variance. Finally, you do the print statements. So that's the description. Those are the numbers. If you're having difficulty with the math, please come ask me for help. That's it for part one. When you're ready, watch part two and you'll learn about strings. And that completes this part of the lesson.